had a problem. And I solved it with this box. You see, we played a field that has no power, and during the winter, we need lights so that the girls can see to play at night. There's four 300 watt LED panels on the field, and they only run about 1200 watts, but they need to run for two to three hours at a time, and, and possibly even more. We're also looking to maybe add some more lights, so I need to be able to grow up to 2000 watts. Gas generators are super noisy and make it very difficult for the girls to hear each other and hear the coaches. Portable power stations like the Jackery, the EcoFlow, and the Anchor Solix, they all, for four to 5,000 watts, they cost over $3,000. So they're all pretty steep and you may be buying more functionality than you need. I'm building my own battery box with over 5,300 watt hours of power for way cheaper. And I'm gonna show you a really neat addition that no other power station has. I bought this Craftsman Versa Stack toolbox from Lowe's because it had 110 pound capacity and a rolling handle so that I could roll it behind me. And it has a simple access with one side where you can flip the door up and get into it. It ended up measuring out exactly what I needed for the inside width of the battery. Now, I needed something for the battery to sit on. So I took some old plywood and I cut it out to fit in the bottom of the box. And then I went back in and marked where I would need to mount the battery and made sure that the inverter would fit. Once I did that, I drilled a couple holes, put some bolts in there with some nuts on them, and then slid that back in the box and fit the battery down on top of it so that the battery would be securely mounted to something inside the box. There is nothing that actually screws through and holds this board to the bottom of the box. There's a little piece of wood that keeps it from coming out and moving anywhere. But I wanted the bottom of the box to be as water resistant as possible. So I didn't want to put screws through the bottom, even though I could use them to hold the battery in. The battery fit perfectly. I tightened down the screws and then I slid in the inverter and started wiring it up because I really wanted to test this proof of concept. I needed to see how hot it got. I needed to make sure that everything that I needed in the box would fit before I started drilling holes into it and making sure that it was useful. I turned everything on, I turned the inverter on, and everything worked just like I wanted. This inverter does have a little remote control panel. It doesn't give you any information. It's simply an on off switch, but it does let you know if it's on or off. Next, we're gonna move over to mounting the charger on the side of the battery. Now note that there is a fan on the outside of the charger, but I'm going to add additional fans for external venting later. This again is just a proof of concept test so that I'm gonna plug it in and charge it up and see if the battery starts charging see how much heat it generates, but suffice it to say, everything looks good. I love the handle that this gives, and with the battery on the bottom end of it, it's easy to pick up and a lot more portable, and I can just open one side of it to get to one part of the battery or open the entire thing. Now we're off to start drilling the holes into the side of the box. Once we start doing this, we're gonna lose any weather resistance we might have had on the box. There is a seal around the outer edge and the top, but most of these receptacles and other components that I'm adding to the box itself aren't as weather resistant as what the top was. I ordered these receptacles off of Amazon and I had to separate the pigtail so that I could insert one end into the box itself and then reconnect it on the other side. So it was just as simple as undoing three Phillips head screws. I'm using a Forstner bit to round out the holes just a little bit more because my hole saw wasn't quite quite big enough for these two holes, but it was pretty easy to fit that around. And there is somewhat of a rubber gasket on these that should help eliminate any water run in on the side. Once I'm done with that, I have to put the pigtail wires back in and tighten them back down before being able to cover it with the sleeve later. These outlets Y into a single connector and that's why I had to disconnect the wires. Now, in this case, the ground was in the middle, the hot was on the right and the neutral was on the left. Pretty easy to to tighten down and slide the sleeve back over. I ordered these two plugs off of Amazon. They're supposed to be outdoor waterproof plugs. They came with screws that would screw directly into the plastic, but I didn't feel like that would hold well enough. So I went ahead and used stainless steel screws and nuts on these to ensure that they never come loose. There's plenty of clearance on these two plugs above the inverter. And I wanted to make sure that there was enough room there so that these would fit nicely. So they're directly in the middle of the box. Next up, we're gonna install this remote switch into the side of it. This just requires using a Sharpie to mark the holes that I needed to cut and then a tiny oscillating saw to cut the square hole out to mount the power inverter remote switch plate into the side of the box. This is decidedly not 
waterproof by any stretch, but it is covered by a small lip in the top of the box that keeps water from flowing directly into the box should it get exposed to the elements. And just like the other stuff, I'm gonna drop a couple of screws and a couple of nuts onto this panel to hold it in there tightly. Once I get done with that, it's just a regular ethernet cable to hook this thing up to the inverter and get it powered up. I'm gonna replace that long ethernet cable with a shorter one later. Next, we're gonna go ahead and install the charge meter. It lets you know the state of charge on the battery itself. This connects directly to the battery. It comes from Epoch. It has a whole bunch of bars and lets you know whether it's empty or full. That'll get us all our readings on the right side and let us know if it's charging. And then on the left side, we're gonna install our charge port. Again, I'm just drilling a hole for this. This has a rubber gasket on it that prevents water from leaking in. There's four screws and four nuts that are gonna go on this port. This port is very specific to a specific plug. And once you use that into a 110 out, Outlet, it will charge the battery up. Last, we have a power switch that we're hooking up that also goes into the battery and it's tied into the state of charge meter so that you can power the entire system off without having to worry about it. Lastly, we're gonna drill some holes into the side of this thing. We're gonna put a vent fan right over where the 15 amp charger sits because there's a fan that blows out. Now I wanna put fans on both sides of this. I'm gonna put one on the left side and one on the right side, and I'm gonna have one where it blows air in, and then I'm gonna have one that blows air out. On top of that, I'm going to have a temperature regulator in there. It trips and turns the fan on variable speeds at higher temperatures that I set myself. Now, the thing with these fans, I ordered them off of Amazon. The ones I got from Amazon were four inch fans fans, but they were not four wire fans. I ended up having to order them off of Timu or something and wait a couple of weeks to get variable speeds in because the first two fans that I installed on here were not variable speed fans and they just ran like a jet engine. I did install a breaker on the top of the battery that will shut off in the case of a power issue. I'm gonna install the temperature regulator. This is just a little control board that I bought off of Amazon, super cheap. And this is what I plugged in the fans. You can hear the fan controller running and they're so loud. So I ordered those replacement fans. These are four wire fans. It took a couple weeks to come off the boat from China, but these are the perfect fans and they fit in the exact same place that the old fans fit in. So I'm gonna install these two fans in each side of it so that when I set the temperature, it regulates the fan speed. It will blow really slow at first and then speed up to blow faster and faster the hotter it gets inside the box. Now, another consideration is that these fans come with super short pigtails on them. So I ordered some extension cables to be able to run the power and the control wire from one side of the box all the way over to the control board. Now, after replacing the inbound air fan with the variable speed fan, I can tell that it's running a lot slower, but you can still hear the other fan on the other side running at a super high jet engine type of speed. So I'm gonna replace that fan really quick and then we're gonna test it out. The temperature on the control board is reported in Celsius and not Fahrenheit. So if you haven't done a lot of traveling to Europe, these numbers probably won't be that familiar to you, but I put it in the palm of my hand to watch it warm up and watch the fan actually increase in speed as I hit 30, 31, 32 degrees. It worked perfectly and then when i let my hand off of the probe the temperature went back down and the fan started blowing slower which is exactly what i wanted so now we're gonna plug in a heat gun and see what kind of draw we get off of the inverter this should be about 1600 watts and you can see on the display there that it's roughly right at 1600 watts this is a 2000 watt inverter with a peak of 4000 watts so this will effectively handle this load well over two or three hours at this rate. A heat gun's not the most efficient thing to test this out with because that's not the intended purpose, but it does work. Epoch does have a Bluetooth app for their batteries, and I can see here how much draw. It's actually roughly around 30 amps of draw for this 1600 watt heat gun, but you can see it's 26.5, 28.1 amps. It's variable as the heat gun warms up and down. I can see how much DC power off the 48 volts we're drawing 
to power up the inverter. And at that rate, you can do some watt hour calculations and figure out how long you can power any sort of appliance or device based on the amperage that comes out of the battery. With a 100 amp hour battery at 30 or so amps, you should be able to get about three hours, three plus hours out of the battery at roughly 1600 watts. I can take this back to the field where we plugged in the lights to make it work. And this is about 1200 watts. It's four 300 watt panel lights. So I know that I can run those for about four hours without breaking a sweat. Well, the girls on the field are probably breaking a sweat, but I don't have to break a sweat worrying about whether or not the battery is going to last the entire time. Usually when they're done with about two, two and a half hours of practice, I have between 50 and 60% of the battery left ready to go. Let's say you use this for camping or something and you're not near an electrical outlet that you can charge this back up with. One of the cool things that I found is this level two charge port. Now, one of the considerations here is that these chargers, it's a 15 amp charger. The charger in the box is 15. This one happens to say 22 because it's for a different battery, but it's either 110 or 240. It doesn't matter how much voltage comes in. And if you use one of these level two adapters for your charging needs, which you can find at just about any sort of public charging station, you're going to get 240 volts through there at, you know, enough amperage to charge the battery. You can actually charge for free if you find some free chargers and top your entire battery up without having to worry about anything. But one of the issues, let's Let's say you've got your inverter out and you're trying to charge your electric car, your, you know, Tesla runs out of energy and you need to charge it up. Well, an inverter like this doesn't have a neutral bonded to the ground. And so if you try and use a level one portable charger to plug into the inverter box to charge your car up, it's going to fault on you for not having a ground. There's a really easy fix to this. You can get a $9 plug off of Amazon. You can plug into one side of the inverter that will trick the inverter and the charge controller for the car into thinking that the neutral is bonded to the ground and it will allow you to start charging wherever you are. Granted, this is going to be a very slow charge over 110. In order Order to charge a lot faster or utilize more of the battery's amp powers that it can push out, you're gonna want a higher wattage inverter for something like this. But let's jump into the cost. You can find 48 volt, 100 to 105 amp hour batteries on Amazon and other places for pretty cheap. I mean, around a thousand bucks. I just had one sent with the state of charge meter and a 22 amp charger for right around 1400 bucks. This Epoch one that's in the kit here will run you roughly 2000, but there's usually sales and discounts. I mean, there's plenty of them out there on the market and I'm sure that you can find something that fits a decent price point. The next biggest purchase is going to be your inverter. And in my case, I only needed 2000 Watts. So I found one on Amazon, a 48 volt 2000 Watts inverter that was only 166 bucks. I mean, I also bought a 4,000 watt one. It was just under 400 bucks, not too steep. And it has two legs on it, could power, you know, parts of the house if there's a power outage or something like that. So depending on your wattage needs, you could even go with something like a solar inverter charger that allows you to tie it into the grid, keep the batteries topped up and allows you to plug solar panels into it for recharging. I don't need that for my purposes, but that's something that's super simple to add if that's something that you wanna do on your kit. The best part about this is it's DIY. So you get to pick the components based on your own needs. If you have two legs and you, know, you need a 240 volt circuit, you can do that. If you just have the one and you only have 2000 watts like me, you can just buy a simple cheap inverter and use that for the project. So you can save money in different parts depending on exactly what you need. Another bonus is you can upgrade individual components over time. If you buy one of those gigantic battery boxes, you can't upgrade them. You can add more for more capacity or more power, but you can't upgrade the individual boxes once you've made that three, $4,000 purchase, you've got what they've sent. This thing could absolutely save you during like hurricanes and snowstorms and just about any emergency that you could run into. I should be able to run a refrigerator or a freezer off of this thing for at least a couple of days without breaking a sweat as, as long as you don't rate it too much. But as long as you don't keep opening and closing the door and it doesn't have to run too much, I mean, at least a couple of days out of, you know, over 5,000 watt hours. So this thing would easily back up me in a power outage situation. But for me, this power inverter build was simply put together to power up some field lights and make sure that it can last three or four hours in case the practice goes long and take it back home and charge it. And when you take a look at the cost 
cost comparison between buying one of these from Jackery or other companies that already make these, they're going to be $3,000 plus. And for me, all told, I spent about $1,300, $1,400 on this battery box build. You can probably do it for just a smidge cheaper if you were really trying, depending on what you needed. Might cost you a little bit more if you wanted to add in solar charging capabilities. I have everything I need with this box and it worked well. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'll do my best to push out more. Thanks for watching.